Hello. So in these videos, um, we're going to talk about Habermann's section, uh, chapter two, section four, where kind of the main goal is to study two similar eigenvalue problems um, built off of this differential equation. So the first eigenvalue problem, um, we're prescribing the derivative at the endpoints of a one-dimensional rod, um, and we're prescribing those derivatives to be zero. Um, in the context of heat flow, you can think of this as, right, the ends of the rod are um, insulated, so there's no flux. Okay. Um, but we can treat this just purely mathematically and ask, right, what kind of uh, functions phi solve this ODE with these boundary conditions? Um, the other eigenvalue problem that we're going to solve is kind of the following, which has maybe a slightly more interesting um, kind of collection of boundary values. Here we're saying, so first of all, notice that we're evaluating one of these functions at negative L. Okay, so in a sense, our rod will be from negative L to L with X equals zero in the middle. Um, but in any case, so we're saying that the value of the function is equal at you know, the two ends of the rod. Um, as well as the derivative is equal at both ends of the rod. Okay? And so in practice, the picture that we will draw isn't actually a rod, but it'll be kind of a thin circular ring. And these boundary conditions tell you something about the kind of behavior of the solution, right? So we want the solution to be continuous where we've you know, brought the ends of the ring together. Um, or brought the ends of the rod together to form the ring. And then we also want the derivative to be continuous kind of at, at that same point, okay? Um, but the focus of these videos are to look at these two slightly different eigenvalue problems. Um, and so the kind of importance of these is, well, this first one, um, kind of the, the, the solution is that, well, the functions phi that we end up with now are gonna be cosine instead of sine functions. But a lot of the analysis is more or less the same, carries through. Um, and then what's interesting about the second one is that the solution functions will now be a linear combination of sines and cosines. Um, and and we'll, we'll see that when we get there. Cool, okay. So for the first um, kind of new boundary value problem, Right, as I mentioned, the physical motivation is that we're looking at heat conduction in a rod with insulated ends. Okay. Um, and so how do we express that mathematically? Well, heat equation, right? heat flow, that's kind of the PDE that describes everything. Um, the insulated boundaries are coming in as the boundary condition, right? the kind of the X derivative or the spatial derivative of temperature is zero, the ends. And finally, we have some initial condition that just says, here's the initial temperature profile. Okay. Okay. Um, so if we kind of carry through with the separation of variables technique, right? We're writing U as a product of phi, right? Some function just of space times uh, G, some function just of time. And so then the resulting ODEs that we end up with is well, um, uh, dg dt. So the ODE for g is this, and then the ODE for phi is this. Okay. Um, and so, right, one of them we can integrate, not too bad. Um, and we, we can both we can integrate both of them, not too bad. But one takes a little more analysis. But um, one of them we can get kind of as much as we can get right now, right away, and that's G. So as the four, G is gonna be an exponential, right? E to the negative lambda KT. Um, and so what we need to do now is figure out, well, what are the possibilities for lambda as well as what are the possibilities for phi, okay? So for phi, same setup, uh, the boundary conditions we were given, right, work for phi. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna analyze separately these three cases, right? Can we have an eigenvalue that's zero? Can we have an eigenvalue that's positive? 
can we have an eigenvalue that's negative? Okay. So we're going to kind of analyze these three and then um, bring them together and just and be able to write out what the solution U for this whole problem um, looks like. So as I mentioned at the beginning, in this case, it turns out that um, we're going to have a series solution in cosine instead of sine, but uh, more or less the same kind of um, analytic behavior and some of the other properties. Okay, so case lambda equals zero. Well, uh, integrate twice. We have our solution phi must be a linear function. Okay, um, and since our boundary conditions are written in terms of the derivative, we also go ahead and compute the derivative here for ease of reference. Okay. Um, so what are the boundary conditions? Well, um, the, kind of the, the main boundary condition we have to work with, right, was, so d phi dx, say, we'll say at zero was zero, right? And that's saying that this function here is equal to zero. Um, and it turns out both of the boundary conditions give us the same, um, the same result here. So what that says is that, right, whatever phi is, we don't have this, right, x dependent piece. So our solutions are, well, constants, right? So we have uh, lambda equal to zero. In this case, that is an eigenvalue um, and that works. And the corresponding eigenfunction, the corresponding function phi is just gonna be a constant, okay? So right now we don't necessarily know what that constant is, but we know that there's some constant um, kind of that makes this work. So that's lambda equals zero. Um, what about lambda greater than zero? So in this case, um, kind of as we've done before, our solutions phi take this form, right? It's gonna be a linear combination of cosine of root lambda x plus um, sine of root lambda x. Okay, so as I said above, right, we're gonna need um, the x derivative of phi. Um, so we can go ahead and differentiate to get this, okay? If we wanted to, we could factor out this lambda up front and a later example, um, I write it like that, but otherwise here's a derivative. Okay. okay, so what do these boundary conditions tell us? Well, so the first one is, right, the derivative of phi at zero, zero. So we're gonna plug in zero for x right there and right there. What we end up with is um, in the end c2 times root lambda zero because sine of zero right here, sine of zero is zero. So this whole term disappears. And then cosine of zero is one. So we're left with c2 root lambda is equal to zero as written. Um, Okay, and so here the possibilities are, right, either C2 is equal to zero or root lambda is equal to zero. Um, we're interested though in the situation where lambda is non-zero, right? We want lambda to be positive. So this is gonna be positive and the conclusion is that C2 has to be zero, okay? So already we see that, right, in, in the form, form of this solution right here, C2 is zero, so we don't have any sine term, and we just have a cosine term, okay? So far, so good. Um, the remaining question we have is, right, so kind of what we found is that for um, lambda greater than zero, the eigenfunction is gonna be cosine, okay? But now the question is, what are the possibilities for lambda here that do give us such a cosine term? And so for that, we can use a second boundary condition. And so this, here we're evaluating the derivative of phi at L. So we're plugging in L right there and L right there. Um, well, okay, take that back. So we said C2 was zero. So we don't have to worry about this term. And so we're just plugging in L right there. Okay, so what do we get? C minus C1 times uh, root lambda times sine of root lambda L is equal to zero. Similar reasoning, 
this term right here cannot be zero. We do not want C1 to be zero, right? Because if C1 is zero, then C2 and C1 are zero. So this is zero, this is zero, and we're left with the trivial solution. Those are the solutions we're trying to avoid because they don't really give us anything. Um, okay, so this can't be zero, this can't be zero. So the result is, well, sine of root lambda L has to be zero. Um, and kind of as we've seen before, this um, kind of gives us that lambda has to be n pi over L quantity squared, which is indeed positive. But um, the takeaway is that these are our eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenfunctions are gonna be cosine of root lambda x. Um, okay. And so then the third case is, well, what if lambda is negative? So in this case, uh, we can write our solution phi in this way as a linear combination of these um, exponentials of real arguments. Okay. Um, again, we can take the derivative. Here I factored out that root minus lambda, but otherwise here's the derivative. Okay. And so we can do a similar sort of analysis, right? Bring in the boundary conditions, see what it tells us about um, C1 and C2, whether or not right, uh, such a non-trivial solution exists. Um, and this is actually part of, kind of the homework assignment. Okay, so it's a relatively straightforward, you know, follow steps we've been doing, um, but this is an opportunity to verify for yourself that uh, we cannot have lambda negative for this eigenvalue problem. Okay. okay. Um, so the takeaway is that, well, when lambda was zero, we had a solution and that was um, uh, just the constant function. And so what I've written here is, right, so u of x comma t, remember that this was the product solution. So I can write it here, u was phi times g. Okay. So here, this is phi. This is G, um, but G, we're plugging in that lambda there. And so this becomes zero. So this whole thing becomes one, okay? So the piece for our general solution to this heat equation with boundary values, um, kind of the piece corresponding to lambda equals zero is just gonna be a constant, okay? The other piece that we were working with was, well, if lambda was greater than zero, okay? So in that case, writing out this product solution, we get, again, cosine of root lambda times x, right? So phi times g, which in this case was e to the minus k times lambda times t, okay? together with some constant in front. Um, and so kind of, right, this lambda is, uh, and pi over L squared. Um, but these are kind of the building blocks that we have to work with for this boundary value problem. Um, okay, so then putting these together, right, taking an appropriate linear combination of these pieces, what do we end up with? Um, this term where, so here I've been careful to kind of take this, right, A0 out, which, so this A0, it's coming from that constant piece, right? It's just some constant term, plus a linear combination of um, these other pieces in here, okay? And so this is our most general form of solution um, for this heat equation with these boundary conditions without having yet introduced the initial condition, okay? Um, but but the, the takeaway is that Right, setting the derivatives to be zero at the boundary, we get cosines instead of sines, but we get a similar sort of expansion of trig function times exponential. <clears throat> okay, um, so what happens if we do try to match the initial condition, right? We have information about uh, what the temperature is at time zero, right? It's just some function f. So uh, what we can do is say then, well, plug in t is equal to zero. So up here, 
plug in t is equal to zero, right? This whole thing is going to go to one. And so then we're just left with these pieces right here. Okay. And so this sum right here is going to equal f of x, which was um, evaluating u of x comma t at t equals zero. Okay. Um, and so I've kind of written a zero and a sub n kind of in this special way. Um, and I've called them a because uh, we call these Fourier coefficients as well, right? They're coefficients related to a trig series solution. Whenever you have trig series of solutions, those are usually referred to as Fourier, Fourier series. Okay, so um, just because these are affiliated with cosine doesn't mean they're not Fourier coefficients, right? They're kind of in the same, I don't know, they, they play the same role as a B sub N did for the sine functions. Okay. okay, so then the question is, well, how do we actually compute these coefficients, right? How do we match our general solution to a given initial condition? Um, so one thing to note is that, well, so the general strategy is gonna be the same. We're gonna multiply by certain cosine functions do some manipulations and then get things to cancel out. And so one of the important pieces is that, well, what is this integral of kind of the product of these cosine functions for n and m, just greater than or equal to zero. Um, so similar to the sine version, which was right, integral from zero to L of sine of whatever times cosine or sine over here of whatever dx, okay? Remember this was like zero if n is equal to m or l over two, you know, n different from m and l over two if n and m were equal. Okay, so some identity like that. Um, so for cosines, we're gonna get a similar identity. Um, but now there's a little tweak if n and m are both zero, right? For sine functions, we ignored n equals zero because sine of zero is just zero. So it was kind of a zero function, didn't really give us anything. But cosine of zero is now one. So it's just a constant function over the interval. Okay, so here we have to be a little more careful, but we have a similar sort of decomposition where um, if cosine, if the two cosines, right, these, these integers that come into play or these, I say like frequencies, if they're different, then um, kind of their products in a sense will cancel out um, or at least right, multiplying them together, compute these areas, you'll have equal positive pieces, equal negative pieces um, because one of these um, cosines is oscillating kind of at a comparable frequency to um, the other one sort of. But the point is that if n and them are different, um, this whole integral is zero, okay? If n and m are the same and non-zero, right? So you're working with an integral like cosine of n pi over Lx squared dx. If you're working with an integral like this, then it's L over two, okay? If n and m are zero, then you're working with the integral like that, okay? And that integral is gonna be exactly L, okay? So generally the integral is gonna be half the kind of the domain right? or half the period of these functions, um, or it's just gonna be the length of the domain, okay? But we have a similar identity for cosine. Okay, so using this identity, um, well, we can kind of figure out what these coefficients are. Okay? So one thing that I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna write this sum, actually I should go up here. I'm gonna write this sum. I'm gonna move this zero inside the summation. Okay, and that's fine because, right, when n is equal to zero, uh, what term do we have? 
well, cosine of um, zero pi over L X. Okay. This whole thing becomes one. And so we're left with A sub zero. Okay. So it's just another way to write the same sum. Um, multiply both sides by cosine of M pi over L times X, and then distribute over this right, infinite sum. Um, integrate both sides between zero and L, okay, and then right, distribute that integral. Um, so technically it's this, and then distribute that integral inside. Um, and so the observation here is that, right, so bring this a sub n outside, and then this integral is only going to be non-zero if n is equal to m. And so in that case, the only surviving term is going to be a sub m times the resulting integral. And that's what we have here. All right, so notice that right up here, this was n pi over l, m pi over l. Um, but because of the because of these integrals, right, and we're summing over all of them, the only non-zero term here is when n is equal to m. And so that's why we have a sub m right there. Okay. okay. This is a constant. We can compute this integral. This is a constant, right? Presumably because f of x is something that's given to us. Um, this is going to be non-zero. Okay. So we can divide both sides by this to end up with this expression for a sub m. Right. So it's one over, and there should be a square right there. But it's one over uh, this integral times this integral is equal to a sub m. Okay. And so then depending on whether m is uh, zero or greater than zero, this constant is either going to be one over L or one over L over two. Okay. Um, and so that's what kind of written here just to be explicit. So, um, right, this is a one over L over two times the integral of F times that cosine. For this one, notice that we're just integrating the initial condition right, and then dividing by the length of the interval. That's because again, up here, m is equal to zero. This thing becomes one. So we're just left with the integral of f of x dx. Okay. So those are our coefficients. Okay, similar, similar strategy to sine, right? The sine series. It's just we have a slightly different identity for cosines. It's Pretty much the same. One special case to consider, um, but otherwise, yeah, we have a way to compute these coefficients, um, which gets us kind of the solution that we care about. Okay, for this heat equation. Um, okay, so then one observation, as well as t goes to infinity, right? Each of these terms, right? E to the minus k and pi over l. When we squared times t. Okay, so this is positive. Generally, for us, k is positive as well. We're not considering negative. Um, but um, as t goes to infinity, this whole thing goes to zero. Okay, so if we scroll back up to the general form of the solution, right, as t goes to infinity, these terms right here. These will go to zero. Okay. So this whole term right here, this whole term also goes to zero. Okay. So as t goes to infinity for an insulated boundary, right, our solution function is going to converge to a constant solution. And what's that constant? It's going to be exactly a sub zero. What was a sub zero? It was the average, right? One over L times the integral of the function over the interval. Okay. And so this was kind of an observation that we made before, right? Where you have insulated boundary, no heat's getting in or out. 
So the total heat content for your rod is going to be con or total thermal energy or temperature or whatever. It's going to be constant, right? So heat's going to flow from hot temperatures to cooler temperatures. So if there's anywhere where your temperature is not constant, right? Let time evolve. It's going to even itself out. And eventually you're just going to have like a straight, straight line. Okay. And so we can also see that um, mathematically. Okay. So that's the heat equation with insulated um, boundaries. The only, the only major difference was, right, we, we changed the form of our solution to now be in terms of cosine functions, but the analysis is pretty much the same, right? We, we have methods to compute what these constants are, and then we have explicitly our, our solution. 